Hello, little woman fans. Welcome to the Little Woman Podcast, the official gathering place of the Little Woman Canon fans. Today's common shout out goes to Sheet Metal Memories. Quote Joe and Mr. Bear don't get into an argument over the sensational stories Joe had been writing. I had forgotten. The book only had Mr. Bear talking about it in personality and Joe's conscience getting stricken all on its own. They don't even discuss it. Hardly. Both the 1994 and 2019 movies would lead you to believe Joe still has her quick temper and that both her and Mr. Bear are capable of having a tremendous fight. But oh, not at all. In the book, Joe matured magnificently and has learned to keep her temper in check. Character development. And Joe and Mr. Bear are shown to be able to get along without arguing. How fabulous. End quote. I have been saying this for ages. Joe and Friedrich don't argue in the book, but for some reason they argue in the movies. And the movies erase Loris and Joe's arguments that are in the books. It is really messed up. In 1994 film, Joe does realize that Friedrich's feedback is totally legit, and he inspires her to write a book that comes from her heart, which is way better than in the 2019 film. In the novel, the real conflict is not between Joe and Friedrich. It is between Joe and her editors. And these next two episodes will be handling Joe's journey. My guest is a star, and she is doing a research on a concept called Hearing's Journey. Hearing's Journey is similar concept to Hero's Journey. For those of you who are not familiar with Hero's Journey, it is a concept that was developed by a folklorist called Joseph Campbell. We can see Hero's Journey still today in books and in pop culture. For example, if we think about the individual journeys of Frodo in Lord of the Rings, Harry in Harry Potter, and even Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. All of these storylines follow the narrative pattern known as Hero's Journey. All of these characters, Frodo, Harry and Luke, of course they are all men. So I was really excited when Star told me about her research about the Hero's Journey and how we can find the female version of this concept from books such as Little Woman and Anne of Green Gables. I also realized that a huge part of the discussions between me and my guests in this podcast is about the hearing's journey. And we often talk about the way the society and cultural critics of Little Woman and even filmmakers of today, they actively minimize the hearing's journey. If you think about that quote from the beginning, a lot of people say that, oh, Frederick is the one who minimizes Joe's writing, which is inaccurate. He is the one who encourages Joe to write what Joe wants in the book. So these people who say this, they either intentionally or unintentionally minimize Joe's own desires and what her goals are as a writer. Because the things that the editor has ordered Cho to write is something that Cho in the book calls trash. It is the same with people who say that Cho was forced to start school. Once again, it is the opposite. In the book, the school is Cho's idea. And in her diaries, Lisa May Alcott wrote that as a young woman, she wanted to start a school for boys. Yet we have so many schoolers and academics and people like Greta Gerwig who completely demonized the fact that Joe wants to start a school or that Joe wants to get married and start a family. Once again, these are things that Louisa May Alcott wanted herself, but a very large part of our society hates that Joe's journey follows the hearing's journey. Maybe it's time to revamp our attitudes towards the hearing's journey. And another aspect of this conversation will be Anne of Green Gables. I know a lot of my listeners are big fans of Anne of Green Gables books as well. 
a lot of times people see Anne in Joe and Joe in Anne and or Gilbert in Laurie. This is also something that Star and I will be discussing. The similarities and differences between Anne of Green Gables and The Old Woman and some of the other Lucy Maud Montgomery's books as well. And I hope you all enjoy this episode. It is going to be a good one. If you are on Instagram, you can follow me at Podcasting Little Woman. And if you want to get notified on new episodes, head over to substack.com slash Little Woman Podcast and join the newsletter. This is Little Woman Podcast, Herein's Journey Through Joe March and Anne Shirley. Star. I have a Tumblr account called Dreamer Writer and Stargazer and I I guess in my relationship to little women is that I've written about it for my a level coursework and I want to hopefully be able to study it further at university. I've written about it specifically in the context of a certain story monomyth called The Heroine's Journey. I have read Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, so Heroine's Journey is a female version of that. So it essentially, it's quite similar in that it's cyclical narrative of the heroes, like similar to the Hero's Journey. However, it was written by a woman named Maureen Murdoch, and she actually wrote it because of something Campbell said to her. She asked him about his views on women going through the hero's journey and he responded that women don't need to make the journey and this is a quote from Campbell himself. He says in the whole mythological tradition, the woman is there. All she has to do is to realise that she's the place that people are trying to get to. So essentially, in Campbell's worldview, Women are defined purely as the prize or the seductress. And then only a part of journey that the hero makes. And Murdoch didn't agree with this. And she was working with women as a women's therapist at the time. And she was seeing how a lot of these women had very similar experiences. And we're going through these very similar life stages. And she researched mythology and religions. And she can see those similar stages. You know, the same way Campbell formed the hero's journey. It learned about the hero's journey. Judy discovered the heroine's journey. And so it's very similar in that the first few stages are quite similar. So it starts off with the hero or the heroine setting out into the world and separating themselves from their family. By the end of the hero's journey, the heroes found their place in the world. And by the end of the heroine's journey, she has decided to uproot society and redefine the world. She has made a place in a new world, essentially. So the difference between the two, it's... In the main character, in the protagonist's response to society and the trials that they are faced with, and it's important to note that. And I think Joe Rutch is a brilliant example of this. I agree. And a lot of that is something that I think will fit into Joe's arc. But we will get into that later. Now, that's interesting with you talked about the hero's journey, how the hero kind of finds his place in the society in the end. That is very similar to Laurie's arc in My Little Woman. Yeah, I would definitely say so. I think if you were to tell the story from his perspective, you would see him become satisfied with his place in the world, which is quite the opposite of Joe. Lori, he wants to be this rebel. He wants to be a musician. He wants to veer away from the life that his grandfather wants for him. But in the end, he comes to the conclusion that he would rather settle for that life. 
that he doesn't have what it takes to be a musician, which I find really interesting, actually, that he allows himself to just be satisfied like that. It's interesting how Moore is very easily satisfied, whereas Jo always seems to be... She always wants to push herself and she wants to move on to the next thing, which I think is another sign how they're incompatible. Laurie is like the biggest procrastinator, which is not something that you see in the adaptations, but it explains how he decides not to pursue the life of a violinist, musician, because he he realizes that he does not have the genius. Yes. And Amy comes to the same conclusion, but I think with Amy it is a lot more nuanced because Amy manages to find a way to practice her art. Yes, definitely. And in some ways Laurie does that too, but he does not have that pressure of being a genius, same way as Joe has. That's really interesting bit about Joseph Campbell. I um, I studied folklore. I'm not that surprised about his quotes because he was born in that time. It was a pretty common, a common view about women at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's not that surprising. You even see that in a lot of today's media when we do have a female protagonist. And maybe she's not so particularly well developed because I don't think any character is perfectly developed at the start of the story. That's the point. They're supposed to become developed throughout the story. When it's the main character, when the main character is a woman, that's when there's a very big issue because if you have a look at like the most recent big blockbuster main characters, there is only a few leading female superheroes, you know, people like Grey from Star Wars and Captain Marvel, you know, Black Widow, all of these characters. We see a lot of female representation screen, but we don't see a lot of female stories. And I think that's really important to know. We have these side characters as women, but as soon as we see them come into their own movies, their own stories. There's a lot of backlash to it. I think it's because even now, even today, we tend to humanize women's stories. I think there's this very strong habit in popular culture, just unless it's like this perfectly complex, nuanced story, we don't want to see those stories. And I think every sort of story is important. And I think Little Women is a very big part of that because you have all four girls and all their stories are important. And unfortunately, I don't think we see that in any of the adaptations. Yes, I I agree. And I also think that there's a lot of demonizing of femininity in the media because if you think about these characters like Ray or Joe, when they have these feminine qualities, they are not embraced. Beside the little woman, you have also studied Anne of Green Gables as part of Hearing's journey. And this is something that I did want to talk with you. I think most of our listeners know about Anne of Green Gables, but maybe there is a person that uh, does not. Would you like to talk a little bit about what is Anne of Green Gables and why Anne of Green Gables matters. Anne of Green Gables, for anyone who doesn't know, is a story about a little orphan girl and she is adopted by um, brother and sister who run a farm, so Marilla and Matthew, they adopt Anne. Initially, they don't want to adopt her because she's a girl and they were expecting a boy. They wanted to have a boy to help them with the farm work. She kind of enchants them so much that they welcome her into their home. And I think the reason Anne of Green Gables is a very important story is is because it's not what we would perceive to be groundbreaking today. It's very much more subtle in comparison to Little Women, but I think there is 
I think it's very subversive in its romanticization and its appreciation of things of femininity and the struggles of being a woman. I think actually that's a running theme throughout all of uh, Lauren Montgomery's work, who's the author. Oh, sorry, no, no, not Lauren Montgomery, um, L. M. E. Montgomery. Sorry, I was thinking of someone else. I think that's a running theme throughout all of her work because she has several. You know, she wrote a ton of books. She wrote the Anne of Green Gables series, which is a series of eight books. And then she wrote the Emily Star series, which is three books. Yes, Emily of New Moon, and she wrote um, Jane of Lantern Hill, and so far those are the only books I've read her. But in each of them, I saw that she had this appreciation and this appreciation. She really uplifts and upholds feminine, what society deems as feminine values, you know, generosity, kindness, art, and beauty. She really emphasizes the importance of these things, and I think it's really significant as well that Anne, she's never really belittled for her beliefs and her love of femininity throughout the series. And I also think that she is also very masculine in some ways. She's competitive, she's bold, she's brash, she's angry, but she is also extremely feminine and neither of them cancel out the other characteristics. And in the end, also I think Anne's love story is extremely important too because it's such an equal and loving partnership and that's incredibly subversive for the time period that it was reaching in. Lucy Montgomery, she was also a big fan of the old man and Louisa May Alcott, which is something that you can see in her writings. I think I wrote Little Women first when I was very young. And then when I was about 15 or 16, I think it was a few years after I read it, I found the Emmy of New Moon series. And I think I remember reading it and just sort of seeing how similar Emily and Joe were. You know, both these very bold, passionate writers and very ambitious, and even Anne is like that as well. There's this point in, I think, Anne of Avonlea, where she wants to write stories, and she writes a story and sends it off to a magazine, and she keeps getting rejected, and I saw how similar Jo and Anne were just dealing with, dealing with putting their art out into the world, and I found it really interesting. I only learned that she, that Lucy Maud Montgomery was a Little Women fan recently though, but it makes sense to me because you can definitely see the inspiration in her work. There wasn't that big time limit between the two books when they appeared, and Anne of Green Gables, it's like a huge Canadian classic. People love, and it has been adapted almost as many times as Little Women. Now, this is also why a lot of people sort of connect the two books together. Not just because Joe and Anne both like writing and they have temper. Well, the biggest difference between the two is probably that Anne is a lot more feminine than Joe. And she's not as angry. <laughs> but definitely a lot of people see the two books sort of being part of the same universe, maybe because they have this strong female heroine in them. Yeah, I would say so. I think possibly another big difference is the fact that I think Anne is a bit more popular because she marries someone who is, like, young and more conventionally attractive, I suppose, or, like, more of the ideal love interest, whereas Joe's choice is much, it's much more unique. And I think it's also quite, and it's possibly something more readable for women now, because I think a lot of women have their own idea of, you know, what's attractive in a partner. But I think if you would compare the two, I think Anne's probably adapted more because she has that more conventional love interest for the screen. That might be true. And I always thought that Q-Bird was somewhat a mixture between Laurie and Frederick. 
because he's kind of described to be this prankster like Laurie, but he never does anything offensive like Laurie does. Maybe they're like the carrot thing. It's the only part. He loves kids. He loves school. He loves academics, which is uh, like a fairy thing to do. That's something that Lori kind of hates. I found an essay for my coursework, my studies, when I was researching. And it was an essay talking about how Anne and Gilbert have this ideal relationship. It's like the perfect fantasy of a rivals to lovers idea sort of dynamic. So I'm just quickly looking for it now because I have a copy of it. This is an essay titled A Girl's Reading by Tammy F. Berg. And she's analyzing Anne of Green Cables from a very feminine perspective through like the female gaze ideas and from a perspective of feminine values and how she's portrayed. And this is from an essay collection called Such a Simple Little Tale by Mavis Trimmer. I really enjoyed this essay because it supported a lot of our ideas about how Anne of Green Gables parallels heroine's journey. And she states, regarding Gilbert's, I've often seen how Gilbert and Anne are the perfect love story because he's, he is her equal in a lot of ways. He's her academic equal and he's her rival. However, he is also incredibly caring towards her and he understands her. I think a very key moment in Anne of Green Gables is when, towards the end, after Matthews died. Spoiler for anyone who hasn't read Anne of Green Gables. Towards the end of the book, after he's died, and they need to sell the farm, and gives up her place at college so that they can keep the farm. And Gilbert's the only one who really learns and respects, who learns about her decision and really respects and admires her for it. I think this is really important because even though he knows how much she values academic, he doesn't think any lesser of her for giving up her chance because it's this moment where he understands her value the value she places on family. He supports her by giving up his own teaching position and help her. He gives up his teaching position at a local school so that she can get it instead. I think this is a really important part of the story because it's not just about supporting each other intellectually, but they support each other morally, which is very similar to Joan Friedrich. That is such an important part of both relationships that they share the same morals. Yes, absolutely. Mention you that I had these two clips from a 1933 Little Woman when Lori proposes Joe, and then the Sullivan Entertainment and of Green Gables from the 1980s, which is the version that I grew up with. And I can't remember who it was, but someone on Tumble pointed out to me that the dialogue is almost exactly the same in the in the 1980s and of Green Gables than it is in this 1930s little woman. So maybe I, I could play these two clips and think about this. I believe that Kevin Sullivan, who wrote this and we gave both series, was very much influenced by Little Woman. I actually have Gilbert's actual book proposal somewhere here in my laptop. It's pretty different than in the adaptation. So I think a lot of people kind of unconsciously make the comparison between Laurie and Gilbert because of these two. It's actually pretty interesting. Yes, absolutely. Yes, in the book. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I've never I've never actually gotten a chance to watch it. My mother has. And she really enjoys it. Yeah, I grew up watching it and I loved it so much. Definitely this part is something that I'm a bit annoyed now as an adult. But that's when we have this podcast where we can discuss all of these things. So I will start with the 1933 little woman. I will. 
1933 version was the one my mom loved when she was younger because Catherine Hepburn. She was a very big fan of her. This dialogue in this step also said it's actually very close to the book. I think this is probably the yeah. closest from all the adaptations. I mainly watched the 90s one and the recent 2019 one or, and the modern retelling one. But I think this one does sound like it's the most accurate to the book actually. It's like they're quoting lines straight from the book. It's less rash and conflicting than the book, though. It's portrayed as quite romantic, it seems. Yeah, it is not supposed to be romantic in the book. And it's interesting because in this version, you know, it kind of starts quite romantic. And then with the music and the things he says, they become sort of more and more disturbing. And you start to feel a bit uncomfortable by the things he says and... You know, in the end, he's like, I'm going to do the devil. And then he says yeah. things like, you you can change me. I, I'll do anything you like. Even though they don't actually quote the book's lines well, I think the 1994 version was best because it captured the atmosphere, how disturbing and upsetting the scene was. Even though the minds weren't the same, I think they really understood that it was a very forceful moment and it was a very upsetting moment for Joe, you know, him forcing herself on her. He's a bit obsessed in that film. It feels very purposeful. The way they make him very disturbing and quite creepy, honestly. You know, there's this scene where he's with Amy and he's saying he always knew it was his destiny to marry one of the March sisters and I think the only reason why the adaptation isn't more well received is because they don't really develop Amy or his love story enough. They show him being creepy and quite disturbing and they don't show him growing from which is kind of annoying. You know, because I really feel like they got the portrayal of who Nori was right in that adapt. They showed how he was kind of entitled and selfish and I think the new film suffers from. They don't show how he's entitled and selfish enough, and they still don't really show enough of his development, Minnie. They don't show him struggling to become a musician and eventually abandoning it. They don't show him trying to be worthy of Amy. It's just really a repeat of his proposal to Joe. I agree, and I think Rada Gerg said that she 
months, Lori, to be this prize that the girls fight over. And I'm like, you completely missed the whole point of his character. But I'm afraid in a lot of adaptations, that is the way Lori is received. And it is some completely inaccurate. I did find the passage that I was looking for. So I just took a quick skim through the book. But the point that was being made by the essayist in the girls' reading is in the book. Anne's interest in Gilbert is never a matter of sexual rivalry. Once she forgives him for teasing her about her red hair, and it takes her long enough to do that, she seeks his friendship because he stimulates her intellectually. The important part is that foundation of friendship, which I think is the foundation for any good relationship, romantic or otherwise. I think you need that foundation of a meeting of minds, even if you're not necessarily alike. And I do think Gilbert and Anne are very unlike each other. Gilbert becomes a doctor. He is quite cool and logical, and Anne is very emotional and flighty. But I think the very important part of the book series is that neither of the characteristics are ever put down as something bad. Gilbert's detachment, his logic, his his scientific mind is never raised above Anne's feelings and her emotional feelings. And if anything, the main message of Lucy Maud Montgomery's Cymru's work is that the emotions and the feelings of Anne's and her love of beauty and the world around her in art is just as important as that of Gilbert's cold, hard logic and science. I think Anne and Gilbert kind of capture that partnership between art and science perfectly, between in beauty and intellect perfectly. I recently read Anne, Anne's House of Dreams. It has the storyline of this man who has these mental issues because he was in an accident. And then in his previous life, this man, who is actually not this person, yeah. they are actually twins, but we don't know what happened to the other twin. Gilbert wants to do an operation, operation on him. So he can have his memory back. And yeah. Anne is like, no, you cannot do that because before this man was in this accident, he was an abuser and hurt his wife and etc. And Anne does not want this person back to their lives. So they have this argument, Gilbert being very rational with his reasonings and Anne also having a good point, not wanting this person to become what they used to be. So I think that really describes their relationship very well. The other one being very rational and the other one being very emotional. Yeah, and I think a lot of people might take that particular debate as an example of possibly some, I guess, misogyny and there is definitely this element, this kind of arrogancy. I was right day to day, you know, I'm, I'm being logical about this. But in the end, Diana's right too. She is right about the impact it would have on her friend if her husband were to get his memories back. I think the fact that they leave it up to the, the wife to decide is a very important part of that story. Gilbert doesn't just come in and do what he likes. It's not his choice, ultimately. It's this is woman's choice, and she willingly chooses that risk of possibly inflicting more pain on herself. Because in the end, it's about not just logic, it's about the morality of the act. It's about returning someone's agency to them and returning their memories and their character to them. And so I think Gilbert's argument isn't necessarily right either, in that it's the logical thing to do. I'm a doctor. This is my job. I have to do it. Morally speaking, I think the point is the moral of it. It's one life against the next. It's the wife's life against the husband's life. It's Anne and Gilbert taking sides, but ultimately Anne can't decide for her friend. It's not her decision, and I think that's the important takeaway from that story. As much as Gilbert thinks it's the right thing to do, it's still not his place to decide. Yes, and I think Gilbert even says that he's going to ask Leslie what she thinks about it. He couldn't actually do anything about it. He had to ask her permission as the person who is the guardian and also the person who would be potentially suffering from the consequences of this. 
And I think this is actually a very common decision that a lot of women have to make in today's world. And I know personally, I've had to weigh up certain decisions where, you know, I've been in a tricky position and I've had to decide whether I have to, whether I'm going to do the right thing, even if it causes more pain. For me. I think that's a big decision a lot of women had to face, be it in the context of work, of sexual harassment of making the choice to come out and talk about being assaulted, knowing that there could be consequences, knowing that there could be backlash. I think it's a very relatable story even today, especially today, because we are still a place where we're stuck in this gray area, where we are stuck in those difficult positions, where we are put in positions where uh, we have to sacrifice ourselves a bit to make the right choice. I think it's one of the better lines in the series as a whole. Yes, it is very powerful storyline. And now that you talked about Gilbert being this rational person, I think Leslie Moore, who is this wife of this abuse abuser man, I think she's a lot like Gilbert, that she is very rational and sort of analytical person. And that's why she also needs Anne, because she brings this enlightenment to her life. Absolutely. Leslie is an interesting character because she's relied on her detachment and logic and her reasoning to survive as far as she does, but bringing Anne into her nerf, it sort of brightens it. And I think it kind of shows how a life just built on logic is not necessarily the most fulfilling life and I think that's what Anne does she kind of comes in she brightens everybody's lives just like with her adoptive parents with Matthew and Marilla she brightens lives she shows them that there's more to life than just existing there's living there's experiencing things Anne is very positive and uplighting person but she also has her moments she's not always like that but most of the time I think it's not even necessarily the sunny side of things. She's very realistic. And I say that in the sense of the experiences she describes are universal for girls that desire to have a dress with puffed sleeves or, you know, that desire to have this outfit that fits your identity of yourself. It doesn't necessarily need to be about the puffed sleeves or femininity, but it's that, that finding something that it expresses you and being able to wear that that's a very universal experience her desire to be intelligent and very strong the desire to be beautiful in any other book it could be presented as this shadow idea that she eventually grows out of but she doesn't she's insecure she's very complex she knows that beauty isn't everything but it doesn't stop her from wanting it and I think that's kind of a very powerful idea for a lot of girls that I think and they have to be able to come to terms with the fact that it's okay to be insecure as well. And is definitely one of those characters who lets you be imperfect because she is absolutely imperfect. She's bright and bubbly, but she's also angry, upset, and she's impulsive and impetuous, and I like how conflicting her character is. She loves dreaming. She wanted to sleep in a guest room because she thought that was like a extreme privilege that a person could have. Stuff like yeah. that. Thank you so much for listening. Star and I continue our discussion next time. They can make good choices. Bye.